Good evening and welcome to Constructing Knowledge, a program that changes how we know the world. I'm your host Mark Straffy and tonight we have as our guest the artist Gary Panter. Gary Panter is among a handful of legends in the world of underground comics. That is to distinguish these from comics involving superheroes. Underground comics are generally more psychological and surreal. Born in Oklahoma, Panter is known for his aggressive punk style from the late 70s and early 80s. He was an early contributor to Art Spiegelman's Raw magazine, and he's done numerous illustrations for album art, such as Frank Zappa's Mothers of Invention and The Screamers. He developed a continuing saga of Jimbo in the late 70s, a disaffected and confused youth who slogged his way through Dal Tokyo, a surreal and futuristic place that belies Panter's affection for Philip K. Dick. Recently, Panter has Jimbo following Virgil through Dante's Divine Comedy in a series of lavish graphic novels. Jimbo is normally perplexed by the world he inhabits, which brings to mind Alice's dilemma in Wonderland. Gary was instrumental in the design of Pee-wee's Playhouse in the 1980s. He has three Emmy Awards for his efforts with Pee-wee. In 1993, The New Yorkers sent Panter to Waco, Texas to do some reportage illustrations and stories about the siege of the Branch Davidian cult. That year, he also did a feature for The New Yorker called Summer in the City. Gary is currently having an exhibition of his paintings from the 1980s to the present, a retrospective at Frederick's Freezer in Chelsea. We're continuing our conversation with Gary, and welcome back. One of the things I wanted to talk about was your collaboration with uh, Raw Magazine. And Raw Magazine was a, an important magazine and graphic in the world of graphic novels and so forth. Um, it was. It was a magazine that really uh, followed hippie comics. Hippie mm -hmm. comics, uh, in their heyday, they were selling a million copies of comics, and then there became too many hippies drawing comics, and uh, the, the form kind of imploded. Art Spiegelman and Bill Griffith, who drew uh, Zippy, the, still draws Zippy the Pinhead, mm -hmm. uh, edited a magazine called Arcade in the early 70s that preceded Raw. Mm -hmm. But uh, Art, uh, Art Spiegelman and Francois Mouly started Raw at the end of the 80s because they became interested in artistic comics that were happening in Europe, and they started looking in America for similar kinds of comics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what do you think, uh, what do you mean by artistic comics? Or, uh, I guess, like, m most comics are, are, if left alone, or are, are as they typically were, they were entertainment for children. Right. And yeah. so these were, like, uh, uh, comics more for grown-ups, comics made by artists, mm -hmm. comics that pretended or are sought to have some literary aspect. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you think uh, that some of the early graphic novels, I don't know if you know Lynn Ward, or mm -hmm. like in the mm -hmm. 1930s there mm -hmm. were some graphic novels which were literally books with no words. I mean, you had to kind of right. read the pictures. So. Was Raw, do you think, continuing that idea of a kind of a more art for art, comics for art's sake or art for art's sake kind of approach? Yeah, I think that Art and Francoise were very much fans of that work and they were fans of uh, uh, publications like The Masses and so on. And mm -hmm. they're very sophisticated people graphically. Yeah, he has a, a real knowledge of the history of publication. Yeah, that, he's I mean, probably art. the best advocate and explainer of comics, mm -hmm. really. And they did find artists from all over the world. And uh, so it was an oversized format. There would always be something special about the publication. Mm -hmm. uh, the corner might be ripped off and taped inside. So there were weird, weird conceptual things that happened with, with a raw magazine. And, and when was that 85 or so? Or uh, again, I guess it was, uh, I have a hard time remembering what it was now. Mid to 80s uh, or something. Yeah. And that's when you, around when you moved to New York, 80, you moved to New York in 85. It had so. started before I moved to New York, so it must have been 84 or so, but I moved in 85. Were you working for them when you were still in Los Angeles? Or yeah, I had started maybe. publishing with them in the third issue, I think. And what did, what did you do for Raw? I kept drawing Jimbo. Actually, oh, uh, Jimbo. I'd drawn Jimbo in Slash Magazine, and now I had him better paper, the possibility of a second color, and uh, a lot of... Uh, yeah. And they were, uh, you know, uh, serious editors. So I had, you know, advocates and editors at that point. Mm -hmm. 
And Francois Mouly is married to Art Spiegelman, and she's <clears throat> is she and she's still at the New Yorker. Is she? She's the cover editor of the New Yorker, and she has her own press that does uh, children's books. Uh, uh -huh. And and Art is uh, always working on. Uh, well, he he became famous for drawing Mouse, the Holocaust yeah. uh, comic, and he continues to work on. Either revisiting that, the, his newest book is kind of like notes about the making of that book. Is and that right? So he's very lauded and he's right. He eternally. won a Pulitzer Prize for a Mouse, right? Right. And um, was was Art Spiegelman doing comics in Raw magazine at that he time? Was. Or he Mouse ab originally appeared in uh, serialized in, in Raw magazine. And that's, but Jimbo had been. You'd already published like whole Jimbo comics and stuff before Raw, or was there were. That? Right, and the first collection was published by Raw of Jimbo, and okay. that was in a cardboard. It was in a cardboard cover with newsprint and the sticker right. on the front. Yeah, and, I remember that one. Yeah. And then there was a Pantheon collection and so on. But it kind of brings up actually collaboration in a way, which yeah. uh, uh, doesn't always work. But uh, some of the friends that I met through Raw, I was able to draw, make work with. Mm -hmm. Charles Burns, I made mm -hmm. work with, and Edwin Pouncey in England. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you did a book called Face Tasm. <laughs> yeah, it was a throwback to those uh, 19th century books where you could switch faces, like children's books, where you could yeah. combine faces. And we did a, a scary version of that because mm -hmm. Charles is really, uh, he's kind of like a horror cartoonist from the 50s in a way. But Yeah, he's kind of film noir. His work is kind of film noir looking, I think. Very much so. It's very dark. And would you, would you and Charles Burns... Uh, you also did some actual kind of panel cartoons with him too, like more traditional stuff with him. Or we just started collaborating for fun uh, on really terrible paper. Unfortunately, we started drawing on very cheap paper, working together, and mm -hmm. uh, then once we realized that it was a serious project, then we switched to better paper and uh -huh. and finished the project. But uh, paper helps. Good paper helps when you're inking and erasing. Right. Uh, and, Bristol, uh, Bristol board. Bristol. Is that three what you draw on Bristol board? It's not actually mounted on board, but it's three ply Strathmore kid finish. Kid finish. Kid finish. Right. You can get plate finish, which is to make a quick line, or kid finish slows you down a little bit. Kid finish is a little bit toothier than. It's, it's toothier. Yeah. But all these papers are kind of degenerating. I would have to say a little bit. Uh, the paper's not what it was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more absorbent now. A lot of art supplies change. Mm -hmm. So if there's a tool you like, you need to buy eight or 10 of them. Uh huh, right. That's because true. they may become obsolete. Do you think it comes through in, an, in a reproduction, or it, does it matter more for uh, looking not at Not so it much. Person? I think yeah. that my work bleeds a little bit in the paper <clears> because uh, I erase a lot and I use sharp nibs to draw, so there's a little absorbency into the paper. Do you do a preliminary drawing before you do a something elaborate? Or In my paintings I do preliminary drawings or cartoons, mm -hmm. preparatory traditional term for preparatory drawing for paintings, mm -hmm. but when I'm drawing cartoons I, I do a lot of notes in sketchbooks and then I just start on the finished page just erasing, erasing and drawing and erasing over and over. You, were, you kind of figure out the image on the final piece in a way you're kind of right. working I, it. I cut the pieces of paper there I'm, I'm going to have do the finish on and I try not to use white out which is a typical a traditional mm -hmm. way of correcting a mistake you make is to paint with white but the paper when you're working with ink like you can't erase ink so you can't erase ink but it takes a lot of elbow you have to have good paper and really good ink erasers and then you've damaged the paper so you uh -huh. can't kind of go back and draw after you've wreck the paper a little bit. But since I'm showing my work in galleries and museums as opposed to a, most cartoons only exist for reproduction purposes yeah. and the art doesn't matter very much. Right. But uh, I'm interested in what the drawings are like and so I don't really, I want them to be nice drawings. Yeah, I've seen shows of, you know, like famous illustrate like James Montgomery Flagg or somebody like that and you right. do see a lot of white or it could just be opaque white of some right. kind you know but when you see the originals you see all that white out. The white's there. white and the paper's brown. Yeah yeah, yeah exactly. So. Um, so when you're uh, when you're doing work on canvas you um, do you really think there's more pressure or something or do you um, 
It's you just, just draw. You just start drawing on the canvas also. It's so different, but I've done a preparatory drawing, and I'm using a really simple grid to mm -hmm. make my drawings bigger. I don't really project. I could project a slide or an opaque projector projection, but I like drawing it freehand because it stays a little more life lively in a way. Mm -hmm. So I do use grids, which are basically dividing your drawing into quadrants and copying the shapes into a bigger version of the From a smaller version, you do a smaller version. Right. And then... Uh, so you made something the proportional and then you're copying it bigger. Mm -hmm. And then... Uh, but I don't like drawing those things, so I find ways of hiding the grid so I don't have to erase the grid. Mm -hmm. and, uh, right. But painting and cartoons are very different. Cartoons are trying to take you someplace into a story like a like short story like storytelling yeah they're taking you somewhere and paintings they can there's many things paintings can do but one thing they traditionally do is kind of arrest your attention in a room relative to this object that has shapes colors implications mm -hmm. and so it's kind of different from comics and I don't really mix them I keep my comic characters and procedures separate from my paintings. Jimbo's never been in a painting he canvas. has been, but it looks terrible. It, <laughs> it looks seems creepy to me to paint him into a painting. Uh huh. Uh, um, a lot of mediums are just better on their own in a way. But you had an interesting technique with uh, when you with illustration also, where you would do um, you would send the art director just color and then a an acetate with black line on it, and then the art director would have to would put the black line and the color together as they saw fit in a way, like you let them, <laughs> I mean, that's kind of a collaboration, don't you think, in a way? It is, if you don't put register mark, registration marks, because right. um, if you're using black lines on an illustration, for one thing also, an illustration, you may have to do corrections. Mm -hmm. So when I do my illustrations, I would work on, they could be on acetate or it could just be on two pieces of paper. Right. So I do my line work on a piece of paper, trace it on a light table, and then do the color separate. And then, as you say, have the printers superimpose one over the other. Now everyone has Photoshop, so you, everyone does yeah, this that, themselves. Yeah, that was the old days, right? But, but I don't really do Photoshop, so I'm still in the old, old days. I don't right. really uh, know how to do that stuff. But that, that's one of the things that struck me about the show you're having right now, or your more, con your more current work, there's no black lines. I mean, and you know, you've always been this, you know, between the comic world and the fine art world, and so your paintings always had the linear element also, that kind of strong linear quality, and now you've, why did you eliminate that from the recent group of paintings? I think it just happened in a way. The different things, uh, I would keep doing paintings and they wanted less lines. And they wanted less and less lines until finally there were no outlines left. But the painting itself wanted the, right. Yeah. That's why I think of it. You know, I mean, you're kind of being sensitive. The painting to as the, an organism. So it's a living thing. Yes. Right. But uh, if you put black lines on colors, it lights the colors up because you've introduced an element of contrast. Makes if, it like neon almost. Or right. Something. It, yeah. And but if you don't put the black lines on, then the colors touch each other, and there's it's a different. Uh, it's softer. In a yeah. Way. You become so, a colorist, you're a colorist, a whereas colorist. so the, the painting has to survive strictly on ideas about color. And if there's not lines, people think less of that it's a cartoon. So my paintings are kind of cartoony, Right. but if there's lines also, then people maybe see them That's as true. big cartoons. Well, and it would also, I mean, the black line would also flatten space to a degree That's also. That's true. And kind of puts everything on the same spatial surface you and your new paintings it. yeah your new paintings are very much about this bizarre uh perspectival space you've created or is that do, have you do you found vanishing points and everything and then you kind of made all these kind of converging lines um so the characters are all set in these right otherworldly i made a very simple optical effect with like you're saying like lines and perspective it's almost like a psychedelic poster, almost. Mm -hmm. And then the imagery, which is fairly realistic, remains flat. And always, and it, my painting is kind of vaguely related to cubism in a way, in that it's never trying to make a very deep pictorial space. It's a shallow, layered space. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's a space about printing or that refers to media. 
And yeah. so I think this continues that. But yeah, once you take the lines off, it looks more like painting to people somehow. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Did we'll you see the show at the Museum of Modern Art a decade ago or so called High and Low? I where think, they, yeah. that, that, that show seemed to really kind of identify this, um, how the low art world or the comic art world might have affected the high art world. And it goes back to Picasso. It goes, it's kind of a 20th century phenomenon, but um, they really kind of define that idea that the, uh, you know, pop culture really, which is no secret to anyone now, but I mean, pop culture influences the salons of high art. It does, and I think that most of the, the uh, painters that we revere as the avant-garde painters in the 20th century were looking at Crazy Cat and Popeye and comic strips, mm -hmm. and also the um, painting, the movies, and the comics kind of pay attention to each other in a way behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. But shows like the High and Low show, they do kind of reinforce the high and the low, and we've kind of moved beyond that point to a certain extent where my students don't really feel the barriers that I felt because right. really being classed as a cartoonist was not a great thing uh, 20 years ago. Uh, right. It's relative to a painter, but now uh, young artists make comics, paintings, music, clothing, whatever Absolutely. they want to do. It's all uh, more of an option now. Yeah, I mean, pop culture is complete fodder for the, for the fine art world now. That it, That's kind of a foregone conclusion. But. And that's where I entered. I love pop art. You know, my father ran dime stores, so pop art made mm -hmm. sense to me. Yeah. And your father was a painter, too. He's still a painter. He paints cowboy and Indian paintings. Mm -hmm. And uh, he actually, he paints two kinds of paintings. He paints, and he doesn't seem to notice, that he paints traditional cowboy paintings that have illusionistic depth, and he oh, paints yeah. emblematic Native American paintings that are very shallow and stylized. Yeah, I noticed that I, I, some of the work that I've seen by him has a kind of a super graphic look to it almost where there's these kind of flat graphics right. uh, with the Native Americans. I think it refers to, I, mean, I, don't, I don't think he's thinking about this, but there was a silkscreen program brought to reservations in the 50s and the 40s, mm -hmm. and there was an artist named Woody Crumbo who was very famous then that did uh, well, but cartoon-like Native American work that mm -hmm. had very beautiful shapes, mm -hmm. outlines, and it was silk screen, which is very flat, silk simple screen. production method that the pop artist Andy Warhol used. In, in the 70s, was this the 70s or something? Like well, the, Woody Crumbo was probably back in the 50s. Okay. But yeah, by the early 60s, late 50s, they were using silk screen. Rauschenberg, I guess, was using it since the early 60s. Mm -hmm. And your father was aware of, or he's working from that tradition, you mean? Or? A little bit. It's funny. He's just kind of a, he always thought of himself as an artist, though he did, he never really was a professional artist. <clears throat> when you were in the house, when you were a kid, he was an artist, or he was yeah. painting? We lived in a house trailer until I was five, and it was full of oil paintings, and my mother and him used to fight about the oil paint all over everything, and, and Is that he, right? he kind of couldn't stop painting. Did he... Um, pursue it as, or did he ever exhibit the paintings or anything? A little bit, mostly in restaurants. He lives in Sulphur Springs, Texas, and so he puts up work in re restaurants. And so this, he still does? He's still doing it. Mm -hmm. We're gonna have a show at Christmas in a little gallery in Sulphur Springs, Texas together, so it'll be mm -hmm. my weird paintings. And you had another mentor uh, from the University of Texas, Eastern Texas, um, that I've seen his work recently, right. and also I forget his name. Lee Baxter Davis. Okay. I had great teachers, Jack yeah. Unruh, Bruce Tibbetts, all these fantastic teachers, but Lee Baxter Davis was kind of a uh, charismatic figure in the art department. He's a Christian mystic, now he's a Catholic lay priest. Mm -hmm. He was, was in a medic in Korea, in the Korean War, and he has his own world of monsters and yeah, oddities. these looked like they were all ink wash drawing. Were they ink wash? Or? They're ink and wash, and he was actually my etching teacher. So he made uh -huh. etchings all through the 60s. He's more of a printmaking or a printmaker. Yeah, or? but now he mostly does drawings. Mm -hmm. He's still he's still alive. He's in his 70s, and yeah, and he's finally got a little bit of recognition in Texas and the biennials and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he had a website with a lot really in, interesting work. I think. No, he was an amazing character. He would stand on the desk. He was small, so he could walk around on the desks in his boots and uh -huh. rave. He was a real cowboy? 
or? He was more of a raver. He was more <laughs> of just, uh, he was more like Abraham Lincoln or something, or Ulysses uh -huh. S. Grant than a cowboy in a way. <laughs> so he does live out in the country. So um, you also have this uh, side of you where you're doing these light shows with Joshua. Speaking of collaboration, I mean, this is another right. collaboration you're doing with Joshua White, who was, um, worked, did, was he at the Fillmore West or the Fillmore East? He did the Fillmore East light shows and Fillmore he did Woodstock. And, and yeah. now we've actually just got a commission to do uh, a big light installation at, at the uh, MOCAD in Detroit. Uh -huh. So that's coming up soon. And, and Josh is a very interesting person. He's, very, he's a really genius in his medium. Is he the one that developed that oil and water, the, where you have two glass bowls and you have oil and water kind of going like a um, amoeba or something? Right. Or? I think that was developed on, on the West Coast, but he definitely employed it and, his, and the people he worked with really perfected it in the 60s because the problem with doing kind of hippie light shows, which is that blobby thing you're talking about, mm -hmm. it's very, you're using uh, colored water and colored oil. Right. But it's very hard to put pigment into oil without it turning black. And so the people, Josh and his friends, discovered that aniline dyes was the way to go. So we cook our own oils and you know, we wear masks and gloves and everything to make these colored uh, fluids to use in the light show. They did that in the 60s, you mean? They or? did in the 60s and we still do. But now there's more things to work with. There's like video light sources that are super powerful now. Uh -huh. The problem in the 60s was getting things big enough, bright enough because the shows got bigger and bigger and bigger. And by Woodstock, it was kind of pointless. Yeah, but we, we had a place in Seattle called Eagles Auditorium, and they were literally using an op an opaque projector, I right. believe. That's what or, you use, yeah. Yeah, and they would it would just be like these two glass bowls on an opaque projector, and right. then they project it behind the band. And, That's the classic uh, hippie light show. Yeah, but so how is what how is yours your collaboration with him? How is it uh, different than the classic hippie light show? Well, video and computers, like mixing those things together. The last show we did was at the Hayden Planetarium on the Dome, which was an ideal place to, uh, to do a light show because everyone could look straight up mm -hmm. and see the show. And there's not a band standing in front of it preening. But there were, you had music with it? Or? It was pre-recorded soundtrack. We've done shows with live, a lot of shows with live bands and a lot with pre-recorded soundtracks. Mm -hmm. And soundtracks made specifically for the light show. And w what is your role in this? <clears throat> well, Josh is really, he's the leader of this thing, you know, because it, he's a, he was a television director, and so he's really good at telling people what to do. And I'm really a person that works by myself in a room, you know. Mm -hmm. like he can tell people where to put things and calculate things, rent things, ship things, and uh, move things around. But didn't you construct, uh, I mean, I've seen some of these live, right. where you, you actually do it as like a performance art thing, like a live it is a live performance. Yeah, right? and it, you've built um, these kind of elaborate structures and so that create shadows. And right, that was the thing I brought to it, was I started using big stencils to make shadows. So you put multiple light sources behind them and you get multiple outputs. Mm -hmm. But basically in our collaboration, I'm following his lead. He integrates <clears throat> some of my ideas, but really he's the master, so mm -hmm. I follow his lead. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's wonderful. And do you ever use them in, you, you also play in a band. What's the name of the band that you're with? I'm in a band called Devin, Gary, and Ross. Devin, Gary, and right, Ross. Our right. names. And we play out about once a month in Bushwick or somewhere, and we rehearse one night, all night, one night a week mm -hmm. for a few years now. And that's been fantastic, because in the religion I was raised in, we couldn't really, dancing was prohibited, and kind of being in a band was somewhat Was it really, was it that? It was that strict. Huh? Oh yeah, we couldn't say darn. It wasn't Mormonism though. I mean, <laughs> no, or... it was the Church of Christ. Uh -huh. It's just another spin-off, you know, a fundamentalist Christian. You know, once, once the common person could read the Bible, mm -hmm. instead of having it just you know read to them, mm -hmm. uh, then all kinds of all hell broke loose. <laughs> yeah. do, you, do you ever use the light shows for your, band, or do you ever? You, Combine the two. We with performed the with the light show uh, uh -huh. on occasion, and hopefully in Detroit we we'll, might be doing the sound work for their show in Detroit. Mm -hmm. but, in the tradition of the like the Fillmore East or something like that, where you have it with the band and, standing in front of it. Yeah, <laughs> we've done that. We did that uh, uh, with the light show, but usually we're trying to put all the attention on the light show. 
mm -hmm. as a medium rather than just a backdrop. Yeah, right, because you're doing it more like, it's more like performance it's art, an art, I think. Yeah, it's an art performance. And um, do you have any of those coming up? You're gonna do that again soon? Or? The Detroit one's the next one, big one, and uh, not for, for New York. We don't have a plan at the moment to do another one in New York. But, you don't? But we're always looking for the next show. You know? mm -hmm. So what about the like psychedelic artists, uh, the, the world of psychedelic art? As a, not not in music necessarily, but um, were those artists important to you when you were? They were very developing? much so. In fact, the light show, psychedelic music, and psychedelic posters were really the thing I loved about the '60s. Mm -hmm. Was there were innovation in all three of those forms happening simultaneously and coming from nowhere. And so yeah. I was really interested in trying to uh, evolve those forms if I could. Yeah, I mean, I think of Alex. You know, Alex Gray's sure. Temple. Uh, isn't that, is that still open in New York? I don't know if it's still there or not, but I've been involved in like uh, panel discussions there and so on. Right. Where? Um, what? Who are the other psychedelic artists, or are there other people that are important to you? Gee, there's there? a lot of them. Robert Williams, Rick Griffin, uh, Victor Moscoso. It was a really an interesting form. Like the hippie comics were some of the light show artists. I mean, some of the poster artists participated in uh, the poster art, mm -hmm. and it was just a real fertile moment. Right, where Robert Williams from Juxtapose magazine, is that? He started, he was the initiator of Juxtapose and the editor for a long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, he started as, he was less of a <coughs> psychedelic poster artist and more of a hot rod artist and a cartoonist initially, and, and really, has worked on his painting career. He's with Shafrazi. Yeah, right. No, I mean, I remember when Robert Williams um, uh, kind of emerged in the galleries. Like it was, uh, he was always somebody who was just a comic guy. Right. Um, but uh, did he do psychedelic posters or did he do those? Not so much. He, did, he, was, he was really very much involved in Zap comics and he also worked for Ed Roth. In the, Big in Daddy the, Roth? Big Daddy Roth. He did the advertisements for Roth, and they were controversial. He would really push the, aver the, the advertisements really far, so they wouldn't always run. Uh -huh. But kids like me noticed them. Advertisements for? For Ed Roth sweatshirts and, oh, uh, and so uh -huh. on. Like when I was 13, maybe yeah. you too, like yeah. wearing a hot rod shirt was, right. you know, if you had to have it. <laughs> well, thanks, Gary. Uh, that concludes our program. Please join us again for our next episode of Constructing Knowledge. Okay.